Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I just welcome everyone back uh, for what looks to be an amazing week at Ray. Um, this is a real pleasure for me uh, to be able to give this uh, Hume lecture because there are a couple of things, as you know, that are true of every uh, Reed student's career while they're at Reed. One is that they take Hume 110, or its equivalent in the past, uh, going back decades, and the other thing is senior thesis. Uh, and one of the things that you also know about uh, Hume 110, especially probably from the alumni magazine after you graduate from Reed, is that every year there's a discussion about what will stay the same and what will change. And one of the things that happened this year is that, as it does periodically, Hume went through a bit of a change uh, from past years, from the recent past, uh, and has been incorporating more material from the ancient Mediterranean world. So the first semester is still mostly Greece, but now with material from Egypt and Persia woven in, I think, more directly. Uh, and in the second semester, along with the Romans and the biblical material that we're doing, we're also now doing ancient Alexandria as well, as sort of a, a city uh, on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. And so this is the lecture that I gave uh, this fall as the changes were, were happening. One of the things you'll see also, and this is perennially debated at Reed, is what, which of the Homeric epics do we start with? Do we start with the Iliad, as is more traditional probably for most of us, uh, or do we start with the Odyssey? And this year we decided to start with the Odyssey. Uh, and again, this was not uh, unanimous that in terms of everyone's sort of thinking that this is what we should do. But we did, and so what I do in this lecture is to try and talk a little bit about why start with the Odyssey instead of the Iliad with the Syllabus. So I'll just get started. You'll have to imagine yourselves now sort of with a double focus. You have to imagine that you're about 19, uh, and you've just gotten to read, and over the summer you received a copy of the Odyssey from the alumni, from you guys. Uh, to read, because uh, I don't know if everyone's aware of this, but you're present to in the incoming class is always either the Iliad or the Odyssey for the students, and the students know this comes from the alumni, and it's a very meaningful gift to them. Uh, but anyway, you're now you're 19, and you're coming, and you're about to experience this course that you've heard a lot about. You might have sat in on a human conference when you visited Reed last year, but now you're here, and this is sort of the opening lecture. Uh, also, in terms of a double focus, You've also obviously had your own experience of Hume 110 from the years that you were at Reed. And so I'd like you to sort of keep both sort of focuses as you go through, kind of think about how it was and how this lecture at least makes it seem. Uh, so anyway, I'll get started. But uh, so we're now, it's the end of August 2010. You've just read the Odyssey, or at least you're, you're supposed to have read the Odyssey uh, before you got here. Uh, and we'll, we'll start. So as you can see from my lecture handout, and I, there is a lecture handout uh, at the back of the room, and there's also, I think, at one of the ends of one of the aisles here, and I'll be referring to that as I go. As you can see from the lecture handout, the title of my talk is Introduction to Homer and the Humanities. It's a broad topic, and I want to start with a very general question. Where am I? Where am I, that is? Where is each one of us? students and faculty alike, as we set off to embark on a year-long humanities course on the ancient world. Where are we, and why do we want to do this? What do we hope to learn from the ancient world, the modern, about the ancient world, about the modern world, and about ourselves being in Hume 110? I want to come at this question indirectly, like Homer might by invoking what the Greeks call a muthos, or a story. It's a story you're familiar with from your reading of the Odyssey this summer. The question I'm asking is, where am I? And this question is raised explicitly by Odysseus at the beginning of Book 13 in an amazing way. As you remember, at the beginning of Book 13, Odysseus, after having survived the fall of Troy, and having encountered all sorts of different places and cultures, has finally, thanks to the amazingly swift ships of the Phaeacians, been dropped off asleep on the shores of his home, that is, the island of Ithaca. Athena, though, has cast a mist over his mind, 
so that Odysseus does not recognize where he is. He doesn't see his own island as Ithaca. And when he wakes up and looks around, he laments, Man of misery, whose land have I lit on now? What are they here? Violent, savage, lawless, or friendly to strangers, God-fearing men? This is an amazing question. Here is Odysseus, the hero of the poem, back in Ithaca, but having no idea where he is. Ithaca, though his home, looks completely strange and foreign to him. As we begin our look at Homer and the ancient world in Hume 110, I want to take Odysseus as our model of strangeness, of coming in contact with other peoples and cultures, but at the same time becoming estranged to ourselves and our surroundings, and even becoming strange to, estranged to our own home. This year in particular, we are both at home in Hume 110, and we're certainly at home in it as first-year students, as read students from other classes, as read alums who are with us here in spirit, and as faculty members teaching in the course, and at the same time, we're somehow not at home. Here we are in a version of Hume 110, which, like Ithaca, has a mist cast over it. It's Hume 110, but it somehow looks different from past years. Now, as you've heard over the summer, and at convocation last week, and from talking with other readies, Hume 110 has changed in a number of ways this year. For many years, the course has focused almost exclusively on ancient Greece in the first semester and the Rome biblical materials and late antiquity in the second semester. Uh, after a three-year process of syllabus review, we've made some significant changes. First, we're starting with what you were sent to read over the summer, Homer's Iliad, instead, sorry, Homer's Odyssey, instead of the Iliad, as in past years. Second, we're focusing not just on ancient Greece in the first semester and the Bible and ancient Rome in the second. We're including significant works from other ancient cultures, including ancient Egypt, Israel, and Persia in the fall, and ancient Alexandria in the spring. These changes can perhaps best be illustrated on maps and timelines, and so I want to take a look at a few maps and then also the timeline on the back of your, of your hand. So here we have basically the map of uh, the old syllabus, or the previous year syllabus, uh, where we have ancient Greece uh, here, and then the sections of the today modern Turkey, and then Asia Minor that were settled by uh, the ancient Greeks, and then also southern Italy and Sicily, uh, again also places, as we'll see later in my talk, that were settled by the Greeks. And this was sort of the map that you could place just about every book that you read in New Montana in first semester. Uh, until this year. Uh, this is a map that probably more accurately reflects what the first semester of Hume will be this year. And that is we still have ancient Greece up here in the upper left-hand corner, but we're also now including material from Egypt uh, and from ancient Persia and also the cultures in between. Uh, we'll be looking at monuments and other uh, monuments, works of art uh, and literature from those places. And so that's first semester, and then second semester, uh, focusing in on uh, the biblical uh, lands, and then also the Roman Empire, which this map basically uh, uh, sort of shows. And then the map for the second semester actually is also exactly the same, except that we'll be spending much of the, uh, uh, the first part of the second semester in ancient Egypt and Alexandria, so returning to Egypt again of cultures in ancient Alexandria uh, during the sort of post-Alexander the Great period after Alexandria was founded. On the timeline, if you look at the back of the, uh, the handout, you'll see that, um, uh, that in the fall semester, uh, and that this is, I've only included the fall semester on the handout, that you'll see not only items from Greece, which I've labeled Greece, but also uh, items from Egypt and other civilizations of the Near East that we'll be sort of uh, looking at. And also in bold, uh, we have works that we'll be reading, not only the Greek materials, but also materials from these other cultures. Now, how will these changes affect what we're going to get out of Hume 110? I think that's an open question uh, that we will all play important roles in trying to answer this year. 
year. There is still a significant focus on ancient Greece in the fall syllabus, but we're devoting much more effort to trying to study other cultures such as Egypt and Persia, not just as in years past as the ancient Greeks saw them, but from the perspective, as far as we can gain it, from these, uh, from these other cultures themselves, at least as far as we can reconstruct them from the artistic, architectural, archaeological, and written remains of those cultures that we'll take a look at. With these larger changes on, on the syllabus in mind, why have we decided to begin the course reading the Odyssey instead of the Iliad? In one way, this might seem like a small change. Both works are Homeric epics, and both works tell us a lot about the Greek world. But in another way, it's a significant change. The Odyssey is an epic which has a very different focus from the Iliad, and one that matches and I think emblematizes the larger changes that we're making in Hume 110. Uh, for this year. In past years, the Iliad dropped us firmly and decisively into Greek culture. Uh, that could seem uh, sort of wonderfully brilliant, but also inward looking. And it focused on a hero, Achilles, who was trying to figure out what it meant to be a hero in the context of a Homeric Greek culture. Uh, the work examines and questions the moral values of Greek culture in great depth, and, it is a, and it's an amazing epic. The Odyssey, though, while also very Greek, was likely composed somewhat later than the Iliad, and has a different focus and a different hero at its center, one very different from Achilles. In the Iliad, as you uh, may remember if you've read the Iliad, uh, while also uh, in the Iliad, uh, Achilles is huge, ferocious, and fiercely protective of his honor, prone to anger, and an unstoppable killing machine throughout most of the epic. Achilles' character allows us to dig deeply into Greek culture to explore its values and character. Odysseus is also a brave warrior, but he's no Achilles. His greatest strengths lie elsewhere. He's smart, versatile, and wary. He is also, unlike the straightforward Achilles, deceitful when he needs to be in order to survive and to return home. He's willing to play many roles, war hero, king, merchant, storyteller, beggar, and to suppress his feelings, to talk to his heart, and to take on any role he needs to, to get home, to punish the suitors, and to be reunited with his wife, son, and father. And unlike Achilles and the Iliad, Odysseus is well matched with the heroine, as cunningly brilliant as he is, his wife, Penelope. As you've seen as we've been reading the Odyssey, as part of his journey to return to Ithaca, Odysseus must be very outwardly focused as he experiences the strange ways of many other cultures. He encounters many different peoples with a wide variety of value systems, <clears throat> ways of treating strangers, of eating, of sometimes eating strangers, not Odysseus, but people he meets, uh, of drinking, of structuring society, and engaging in politics. And although composed soon after the Iliad, the Odyssey shows us a Greek world that seems to be reflecting more about the nature of other cultures, wondering about the possible range of human societies, and examining its own culture and values in dialogue with these other cultures. I've given some intro view lectures in the past on the Iliad, and my main theme was an exploration of Greek culture with the thesis, the ancient Greeks are strange. <laughs> In the context of this year's version of Hume 110, and in the spirit of Odysseus as he meets many different cultures on his travels, I want to modify the theme of my lecture radically, actually very slightly, from the Greeks are strange to ancient cultures are strange. The theme of my lecture this morning then is the strangeness of ancient cultures, and in one sense I suspect that this is not news to you. You probably thought something like this while you were reading the Odyssey over the summer. Odysseus, his fellow Greeks, the Greek gods and goddesses, and all of the many cultures that Odysseus encounters seem pretty weird. Nor is it surprising in light of the 20th and early 21st century sort of scholarship that's been done on the ancient world. Prior to the 20th century, the ancient Greeks, and especially the 5th century Athenians, were often somehow seen as kind of a model culture somehow like us 
to differentiate them from other cultures in the ancient world. And some scholars spoke about a Greek miracle, an apparently isolated and unexplained flowering of Greek culture that was unparalleled in the ancient world. At least that was the old view. But work by many scholars in the last 60 years has examined not so much the ways in which the ancient Greeks were like us, but the ways in which they differed from us in many areas, including politics, religion, and conceptions of gender. As scholars have worked to make the Greeks more strange to us, simultaneous developments in the study of Egypt and the ancient civilizations of the Near East have allowed us to see more connections between the Greeks and the older and contemporary cultures that surrounded them. Scholars no longer speak of the Greek miracle, but instead of the Greek borrowing from other cultures and adaptation to their own culture. And scholars are continuing to explore links between ancient Greece and the art, architecture, material culture, myths, stories, literature, and laws and philosophy of Egypt, Babylonia, Persia, and other civilizations of North Africa and the Near East. Thanks to the work of these scholars, we can see more clearly that the Greeks shared their strangeness with their more powerful and often older neighbors to the south and to the east. The notion of strangeness of the ancient cultures is an important one and a good theme with which to begin our study of Greece and the ancient world in this course. So why are we studying the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Israelites, the Persians, and Romans in this new iteration or modified iteration of Hugh 110? This is a good question. First, these cultures have made uh, important and obvious contributions to human civilization. And we'll have a chance to explore some of the ways they influenced each other and the continuity and differences between the ancient and modern worlds in art, architecture, literature, political structures, societal makeup, religion, and philosophy. Second, the works these ancient cultures produced in literature, history, politics, philosophy, and art continue to be thought-provoking and raise important issues about human existence for us today. Third, many of these cultures provide a density of texts and materials that can be studied fruitfully in an interdisciplinary way, allowing us to contrast and unite the approaches of many different modern academic disciplines, including literature, history, art history, philosophy, religion, political science, anthropology, and sociology, to name a few. Fourth, and perhaps most importantly though, uh, through a study of the Greeks, Egyptians, Israelites, Babylonians, Assyrians, Persians, and Romans, we can learn so much about ourselves uh, and the culture in which we live in today, and especially begin to study how different cultures interact and influence each other. Although these people have played an important role in the development of the modern world, we should not make the mistake of thinking that they will, def they, they will therefore be familiar to us and like us as we meet them this semester. We'll discover many examples of this type of strain, of the type of strangeness we've already been struck by as we read the Odyssey this summer. But there's an even deeper kind of strangeness, more subtle and more important, that we should be on the lookout for as we read the Odyssey and the text to come. And that's the strangeness that lies behind the strange practices that we're already beginning to notice in the Odyssey. And that is the strangeness of concepts or values. In other words, the strangeness of the categories that ancient peoples used to describe and analyze things. The way in which they divide up and make sense of the world. This is important to notice because we'll be reading texts in English translation. And by the very act of translation, much of the strangeness of ancient ways of thinking runs the risk of being lost forced into English words and categories of thought, lost in translation. What we must do to try and overcome this problem is to read, as, uh, read carefully enough so that we'll not only see the obvious ways in which ancient peoples are strange and different from us, but we'll try to notice more subtle ways in which their categories of thought and values differ from ours. And this is exactly the thing, if we think about it, that Odysseus has to do, or at least try to do, as he sails into a strange port or washes up on a strange island. He doesn't make the mistake of thinking that all cultures are going to be similar to his. 
He tries to be open and as flexible as he can, waiting to see what or who appears, ready for strangeness. Unlike his men, who are often terrified and want to flee, even before the local inhabitants appear, Odysseus watches carefully. He is always ready to encounter the unexpected and figure out how to deal with it, to believe that things might not be what they first appear to be, and to investigate more and more deeply into things to figure out what is really going on and how can I survive. Odysseus is a great image, I think, uh, for us to take as we encounter the material of Hume 110. The need to be prepared for strangeness, to assume that things will probably not be what they appear to be at first, as we encounter the ancient cultures that we'll meet. The more strange and unfamiliar the Greeks and other ancient cultures begin to seem to us as we encounter them, the more we'll see the differences between the way they viewed the world and the way each of us views it. Ultimately, this process should lead us to clarify and examine our own culture's values and our ways of looking at the world that we often take for granted. Why do we look at the world differently than the Greeks and other ancient peoples will encounter? If we examine the cultures we're studying with open minds, we may find ourselves and our own values becoming strange to us as we compare our views of the world with the Greeks perhaps in a way similar to the way that Ithaca looks strange to Odysseus on his return. Now to emphasize the strangeness and the foreignness of the ancient world, I want to read the first five lines of the Odyssey, uh, and I'll just read it line by line. And I think this isn't on your handout, but you have to imagine you have an imaginary copy of the Odyssey, and you're looking at the first lines in English uh, as I sort of read, the, uh, read these lines. Andra mo en nepe mus apolutropanus malapola, plantea pe troyes hieron talia throne persen, polon antropon idem astea kai nomon ekno, polatogen panto paten algea hon katatu mon, ar numenos hente psu ken kai noston hetai. Some of us did while we were at Reed. Uh, but anyway, uh, this passage probably looked pretty, probably sounded pretty strange and different than English. And a couple obvious differences. One is that you probably heard that ancient Greek, as far as we can reconstruct it, had a pitch accent instead of a stress accent. So you could hear, hopefully, my voice, though I don't have a very good singing voice, going up and down in tone as I was reading uh, the, the lines. The other thing, besides the tonal accent that you might have noticed, is that ancient Greek epic was written in meter. And this particular meter, again, as you may remember uh, from uh, your past, is called dactylic hexameter. And if you look at the bottom of the first page of the handout, you can see that I've sort of put on there uh, an analysis of what this looks like. So a dactyl in ancient Greek is sort of a long and two shorts. And a short differs from a long syllable in that it's pronounced about twice as fast. So a dactyl is ba, 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 something like that, that basic rhythm. So ba, ba, ba. And then a dactylic hexameter, the hexameter, there are six of those dactylic units that make up each Homeric line so that the bard can sing in that rhythm. So ba, 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 ba is the ba basic rhythm, but so that it doesn't get monotonous very quickly. Uh, for a dactyl, you can substitute a spondy, which is too long. So it's the same, instead of long half-half, or one half-half, you have one-one. Or you know, So you can substitute a spondy in most places in the Homeric line. So you can go bum, 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 bum. So you can have a dactyl, spondy. And so some lines will be mostly dactylic, some lines will be mostly spondaic, but all of them fitting into this sort of dactylic hexameter frame. And we'll have a chance uh, to get to feel this more intimately in a, in a little while about the, the meter. So where did these Homeric poems come from? To understand this, let's turn to a map and a timeline. Okay, so here we have a map of the Homeric uh, world. Uh, and just to point out a few things, 
again, both for the Iliad and the Odyssey, this sort of map serves us, with, again, Troy up here in sort of what is now on sort of the northwest coast of Turkey. Uh, and the Trojan uh, characters are in red, uh, and then the purple is for the sort of where various Greek heroes. So just to point out a few places, we have ancient Troy here, uh, and then uh, in the Greek world, we have here Mycenae, uh, from where sort of Agamemnon, uh, Agamemnon was. Clytemnestra is waiting here to kill him when he gets home uh, for, for sacrificing his, their daughter, but that's another, uh, that's another story and another tragedy. Uh, but we have Athens here, uh, we have Thea up here, from Achilles is from this area of Greece. Uh, but the hero of our tale this morning uh, is uh, Odysseus, and our heroes, Odysseus and Penelope are from the island of Ithaca, which is all the way on the west side uh, of Greece. So this gives us at least kind of an idea about where some of the Homeric geography is from. Um, and then also just to look at a few dates on the uh, on the handout, I get on the, the timeline on the handout. I obviously don't have time to go through everything. This is a, really a basic framework for this semester for us. Uh, but on that handout, I've tried uh, to mark again sort of the areas for this morning in, with Greece as a label, but just other labels as well, Egypt and the Near East, to let us know sort of what's happening about the same time. And on the handout, I've tried to give general divisions of the time period that we'll be covering this semester, the Bronze Age, the Dark Age, the Archaic Period, and the Classical Period, and within each of the dates, the general part of the world, Egypt, Greece, or the Near East, where these events took place. And I should emphasize right now that most of these dates are very approximate, uh, and they're roughly sort of what scholars agree on, but again, it's very hard with many of these dates to be really precise, so uh, again, take all of the dates uh, especially the oldest ones with, with some grains of salt. Um, many items on this handout will become familiar to us as the semester progresses, but for the purposes of introducing Homer, I want to focus on just a few items. If we look at a few of the items on the handout labeled Greece to situate our reading of Homer in the context of other cultures, I think that'll be helpful. So starting with the Bronze Age, uh, in that period, in, from 1650 to 1200, again, marked Greece. We have marked there the height of the Mycenaean civilization on mainland Greece. And again, remember that on the map here, Mycenae is in this area, but also, uh, so there was a, a very famous sort of Bronze Age palace structure in Mycenae, uh, and uh, also, though, at other places, uh, there were, especially around the Peloponnesus, uh, other uh, fortress citadels during this same period. Mycenae was not alone. Those seems to have been the most powerful. And it was during this period from 1650 to 1200 uh, where sort of the, the Mycenaean civilization reached its peak, uh, along with a system of writing, one of the earliest systems of writing in the ancient Greek mainland, called Linear B, uh, a script that they had adapted uh, from the island of Crete, uh, from the Minoans on the island of Crete, the Greeks had borrowed their, their syllabary and adapted it to ancient Greece. And the Mycenaeans had used writing not for literature, but for record keeping and controlling their economy, basically. It was a very palace-centered economy where all the goods sort of came into the palace, records were kept of them, and the goods were distributed out from this central palace area. Uh, and this is the period, the Mycenaean period, that's linked to the actions and the heroes that are described in Homer and the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, also on the timeline in the Bronze Age, from 1250 to 1220, we have the fall of the city of Troy. And again, archaeologists debate how accurate the Iliad and the Odyssey are in terms of being a historical record, but there's no doubt archaeologically that around 1200 BCE, a level of Troy, because Troy existed for many, many centuries, a level of Troy shows a destruction which is at least sort of, you know, possibly connected to some kind of destruction, the kind of destruction that's talked about in the Iliad, uh, or at least hinted at the Iliad and then described in, in later epics. Uh, and so this is, you know, around 1200 then is really when the Iliad is set historically, insofar as it's historical. And uh, again, shortly after that is when the Odyssey takes place. 
Um, but after those Greek heroes, again, if there's a historical basis in that, reach home, it's very shortly after that, between 1200 and 1150, when we have a collapse of those Mycenaean centers, the collapse of Mycenaean cultures. And again, archaeologists can find in all of these citadels, uh, with very few exceptions, some kind of destruction uh, that happened, that occurred there. Uh, and again, there's still, I think, uh, uh, I think the, the jury is out on exactly what caused those destructions where they're kind of a, a group of kind of external invaders that went systematically and wiped them out, or their internal revolts, was it a combination of things? It's really hard to tell uh, from the archaeological record. Now, once the Mycenaean civilization has had collapsed, writing is lost, as far as we can tell. We have no written records from after 1200. Um, uh, for quite a while, for a number of centuries. And we do know, though, that though writing is lost, an oral tradition, you know, including stories of the great things of the past, the great events of the past, including the events of the Iliad and the Odyssey, were retold generation by generation by the equivalent of Homeric bards that would sing these stories and elaborate on them. Um, and so this is during the period which, again, has been conventionally labeled the Dark Ages, just because we know so little relatively about this period. From 1150 to 800, we have sort of Greece trying to recover gradually from this disaster, the destruction of the Mycenaean uh, culture. Um, after the palace cultures of the Mycenaeans had collapsed, uh, it seems like power devolved into a sort of more local control. So we have sort of local chieftains not so much in a power, uh, in a palace-centered society, but chieftains trying to keep control. Um, and we have gradually, um, over a, a few centuries, the rise of what comes to be called the polis, or, or the Greek city-state. Uh, and this occurs towards the end of the Dark Age period, so roughly by around 800, we have what Greek historians will call polis culture, uh, rather than these, you know, citadel cultures, uh, of the Mycenaean period, we now have sort of, again, what we recognize as uh, small city-states. And once again, writing comes back into Greek culture, this time no longer using the linear B syllabary, but now using characters that the Greeks borrowed from the Phoenicians. Uh, and the Greeks adapt the Phoenician alphabet uh, using some of the characters to create vowels, which the Phoenicians uh, didn't have, they just had consonants. Uh, and adapt it to their own language. And it's a much better fit uh, than the syllabary had been for ancient Greek. And so once writing is uh, sort of, again, sort of re-enters Greek culture, we have it being used almost immediately for, among other things, uh, recording the Homeric epics uh, for the Iliad and the Odyssey. So it's around the time after 750 uh, when the Odyssey and the Iliad take their final shape and uh, sort of become written documents as well as uh, oral documents uh, and, and really sort of become the poems that we know them. Uh, in the Archaic period, uh, again, I won't say much about the Archaic period except that around the time of Homer, from 720 to 700, uh, as Homer is composing the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Greeks start to colonize right from about 750 onwards southern Italy and Sicily. So we get uh, Greek settlements there. Before that, the Greeks hadn't reached those areas, Sicily and southern Italy. Now I'll let you look at the timeline more on your own if you're inclined to. The main point I want to emphasize, though, with it, is that the Odyssey took its final shape over a period of four to five hundred years. And the, so four to five hundred years separate whatever happened in Troy and afterwards uh, with sort of what we know as the Iliad and the Odyssey. So there are about four or five hundred years of oral tradition that works on these stories. Now, to turn to Homer himself and to sort of do a very brief introduction to Homer, I want to look at the beginning of the Iliad and the Odyssey and raise some initial questions. And I'm going to have to give a very brief overview, but again, it will be up to all of us this year in U110 to fill out some of the things that we'll talk about now. I want to return to the statement I made towards the beginning of my talk, that ancient peoples are strange in the context of the Odyssey. And what I want to do is think a little bit about the opening of the Iliad and the opening of the Odyssey, and the ways in which the Odyssey is somewhat different from the Iliad. Um, 
And I think the best place to begin is with the first line of the Odyssey. And it's always my dream every year, uh, each year, to take uh, over 400 of us. I get we're a little less than 400 this morning. But normally in the lecture hall in, uh, in Volum, there'll be about 400 of us chanting Homer in ancient Greek. Uh, but this year, before turning to the first line of the Odyssey, we have to make a detour to the first line of the Iliad. It's been a human tradition for roughly the last 20 years or so to chant the first line of the Iliad in ancient Greek. Greedies have been known to identify each other all over the world, almost as if they were using a secret password or phrase by their ability to chant the first line to the Iliad each other. And I kid you not, I, get, I hear stories from alums that that is one of the secret handshake equivalents that they do, is that they'll chant the first line of the Iliad together. So, uh, what we'll do, and we will, uh, and I, as I say in my lecture, uh, so we'll be able to interact with recent alums. We'll have to start by chanting the Iliad, the first line of the Iliad, and then we'll start a new tradition this year by also chanting the first line of the Odyssey. So, uh, so comparing the two, I think, is a good way to bring out important differences between the themes of the two epics, and why, given the new syllabus, we're reading the Odyssey this year. So, okay, so I have the opening lines of the Iliad, of the opening line of the Iliad, on your handout, but also up here as well. And you'll notice that the, I have the line here written in ancient Greek. Uh, and then this is a transliteration uh, of how to sound out that Greek line in English. And we'll go through, that's the line that we'll be reading from and chanting from. Uh, and then this is an English translation, sort of word by word, sort of ungrammatically, about what each of those words mean. So what I will do, and uh, I'm, I'm now just inviting you to join with me, I'll say the word, uh, and then I'll have this uh, sort of red light here, uh, and then repeat the word after me, and then we'll just gradually build up the first line so we can, we can chant it. So, uh, so the first word, which means anger or wrath, Mainen, Mainen, Aede, Aede. Okay, good, let's put those two things together, and I'll chant them first, and then chant after me. Okay, good. So let me repeat those three words and then repeat after me. Very good. Now, this is the most difficult word to pronounce in the Greek language. No, not really, but, uh, but it, so, Consisted of being Peleus' son, uh, 
as well. So again, this first line packs in a lot about Homeric culture. Um, now let's take a look, um, and actually, I have one very cheesy thing uh, this year, so, uh, and that is the thunderbolt of Zeus. Uh, so, we'll read this line one more time, following the thunderbolt of Zeus. I apologize for how, for how cheesy it is. You can see it's going to start dancing. Okay, so just humor me, and we'll do this. Okay, so, just we'll try it one more time. Man. Why not? 
might say Odysseus in the open mind, why have you be a man? Second, moi, to me, uh, and again, this is in the voice of the poets, tell to me, muse, that to me makes explicit what the first line of the Iliad does not, that the muse or the goddess is singing to someone, here to a bard, to me. And we'll see that in the Odyssey, poets, singers, rhapsodes, and storytellers are much more important in this poem than they are in the Iliad. And we might ask, why? Why is storytelling so important in this poem? <coughs> the next word, the third word, enipa, is a kind of a bland word, which means simply something like narrate or tell. It doesn't mean sort of sing, as the, the equivalent word does in the Iliad. And it really sort of gets at the notion of narration, of telling a story, rather than just the chant. That rather than just chanting or singing. Musa, and again, notice we have a slightly different way of referring to the goddess that's going to inspire this poem. Uh, we have here uh, not just the sort of nondescript goddess of the Iliad, but a specific sort of muse, uh, and at least sort of one of the nine daughters, the muse, one of the nine daughters of Zeus and his wife, Memory, or Namasene. And then probably the first, the most important word in the poem, again, not saved to the end of the line this time, is polutrapon, that I've put up here. It's one of the most important words of the entire poem. It's a key epithet of Odysseus, and it's somewhat ambiguous. It literally means polu, much, and tropos, turning. And it can mean either much turning in a physical sense, much traveled, or it means some, that in a moral sense, or in a mental sense, in other words, much turning, crafty, versatile, sly, mentally flexible, and inventive. And it announces a key element of Odysseus's personality. And it's one of a number of epithets of Odysseus in the poem, referring to his poly or multiple character. And here are some of the chief epithets, all beginning with polo of Odysseus. He's polotropos, much turning. He's polometus of much matis, or of much sort of cunning intelligence. He's polu mechanos, he's much machining, or something like that, of many devices, contraptions, resourceful. He's polu fron, he's much, he has a lot of fron of intelligence. And he's polu tlos, tlos means suffering. So along with, he's got to have good wits, because he suffers a lot, he's got to figure out how to get out of a lot of jams. Um, now contrast this, with the primary epithets of the other chief character of the poem, of Penelope. Penelope is not polu, but she is from. She's really intelligent, and she's peri from, or thinking around. In other words, she takes a 360 degree view of things. Nothing really escapes her, circumspect. And eke from, meaning holding on to your from, not losing control, sort of ever, sensible, or prudent. And so those are, the, again, the, the epithets that really, among others, echo throughout the poem as we, as we read it. Now, polutropos is a very different quality than the other Homeric heroes possessed in the Odyssey and the Iliad. Achilles, Ajax, Menelaus, Diomedes, and others were great fighters, swift-footed, good speakers, but none were polutropos. This is really Odysseus's epithet that he has to himself. And in a way, I think, the Odyssey can be seen as a meditation on what it means to have a hero, or a hero and a heroine, looking at Odysseus and Penelope together, who are polutropos and periphron at the center of the poem. Now, the last three words of the first line, post malapola, just literally means sort of who very much many things. And it basically just says, and a lot of stuff was thrown at Odysseus. But he was polytropos, so he could handle it. And that really, that's really the poem. And I think what I want to do to conclude is just look at the, the opening uh, of the poem in, in, in English and just read it, and I'll just have a few words and then conclude. So sing to me of the man muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and again off course, once he had plundered the Halloweites of Troy. Many cities of men he saw and learned their minds. Many pains he suffered, heartsick on the open <clears throat> sea, fighting to save his life and bring his comrades home. And again, uh, as we go off to our conferences uh, to discuss the poem this morning, uh, a few other things just to keep in mind. 
Notice that the beginning of this poem really tells us that this is a post-Trojan, a post-Troy epic. It's almost a post-apocalyptic poem. The poem constantly plays off the Trojan War and the heroes who fought and died there, and what comes after. The sense that one era has ended and a new one is beginning. Are the virtues that worked in Troy the same virtues that are going to work in this post-apocalyptic world? The poem examines this, especially I think in the scenes of the underworld when Odysseus meets Achilles and Agamemnon in the underworld, and they talk about Troy and now. And there's a real contrast, I think, between the world of war and whatever world Odysseus and the, his fellow Greeks now find themselves in. Second, there's the theme, right from the first lines, of understanding other cultures. Uh, as we saw there in the fourth line, many cities of men he saw and learned their minds. And also notice that in this poem, in the last couple of lines, there's a real theme of suffering. And the poem, I think, asks us to reflect upon where does suffering come from? Does it come from the gods, from human actions? Are human beings responsible for the sufferings that we undergo? And how are humans to understand and endure this suffering? I think these and other questions will, you'll, will, that will come up in conference will help you get started on our discussion of the Odyssey. And as we start to discuss these questions, I want to leave you with two other questions to ponder, the last two on my lecture outline. What can the Odyssey tell us about the ancient Greeks? And what can the Odyssey tell us about our relationship to other cultures? There are many possible answers to these large questions. The poem is so long, expansive, and contains so many themes that it truly requires its readers to be, like Odysseus, polytropos, much turning, to deal with it and to try to put it in perspective. And I'd like to conclude by proposing that we think about Odysseus as we see him in the lands in Ithaca, and unable to recognize it at first. Again, remember that scene from 13 where he doesn't realize he's back home because Athena has put a mist on the island. That that's a model for us as we work our way through Hume 110 this year. As we ask ourselves, where am I? I hope we can be like Odysseus, polytropos, and open to strangeness. And also like Odysseus, not naively open, but wary, slow to be taken in, and prepared for anything. Thank you.